Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Today I'd like to rethink the grid towards less distorted imagery and this new coming up buzzword called AI. The thing is, map distorts our view on the world. If you compare the size of um, Greenland and Africa, for instance, on the map it looks almost the same, but of course, in actual reality, it isn't. And it does not only distort the views of our eyes, but also those of machine learning models. And this is, of course, because the Earth is a three-dimensional thing and maps are two-dimensional. So there's some data loss in between. And it's always a trade-off between having projections that are either equal area or equal angle. And these distortions matter. And these distortions matter at least at global scale. And um, these distorted images are also being presented to neural networks. And those models learn the patterns from distorted images. And this is maybe one reason why deep convolutional neural networks generalize so poorly uh, when it comes to even small image transformations. One solution might be to use local projections. They have been used um, quite extensively in the past, especially um, from polar um, scientists, for instance, um, because in traditional um, projections, distortions are the highest next to the poles. But we are at the Open Earth Monitor project, and we want to do something at global scale. So another approach is to use multiple projections instead. It's been around since World War II, and um, the idea is um, to basically um, distribute um, the Earth into different zones and making a local projection based on each zone. The thing here is that despite the zones um, tessellate the Earth perfectly, um, they are not rectangular. But the tiles we are making out of those zones are rectangular. And this leads into some overlap, which is quite substantial. In Sentinel-2 data, for instance, um, this leads into duplications of about a third of our data. And that's data that needs to be duplicated and it needs to be stored, it needs to be downloaded, and also needs to be processed. So we are not wasting only data with Sentinel images. Um, of course, we have similar issues um, in Landsat data. However, here the overlap is uh, less, but the shape distortions are more. So analog paper maps, they force us to make two-dimensional maps. However, digital data structures are way more flexible. So one idea is to use other systems to tessellate the Earth into equal area um, cells, like those based on polyhedrons. For instance, we have this truncated icosahedron being used in football, or this triangular tessellation being used in architecture. Examples of those grids involved the icon grid, sorry, um, the icon grid, um, which was um, being developed um, by the German weather forecast system, and um, it's also being applied um, by Google um, Graphcast. So here we are basically um, using an icosahedron, which is the platonic solid having the most um, number of faces, um, in order to use it as a scaffold to tessellate um, the Earth into equal area tiles. The thing is that those are based on modeling, where the bottleneck is the compute. In, when it comes to analyzing Earth observation data, like satellite data, for instance, our bottleneck is data loading, and maybe not only compute. Since um, we do modeling, there is no camera being involved, so they do not need to talk about projections. And the resolution is also a little bit lower compared to high-resolution satellite imagery. So we need to think about projections, and we also need to think about data structures. And one solution might be um, these um, equal um, area 
grids like this um, Equi um, 7 grid um, Wolfgang uh, Wagner presented us um, yesterday. And another solution might be the use of discrete global grid systems, which basically takes this idea of a polyhedron and adds a projection and an index to have an efficient data structure for high-resolution satellite imagery. So we are trying to not wasting those petabytes um, because um, those cells are able to cross multiple phases of the polyhedron, and um, this is the way in order to minimize um, the overlap. And this saving of data is important, not only because we need to store and download them, but because in machine learning model training, the time usually is dominated um, not by the actual um, computation, but by the data loading and the preparation. So all of the images needs to be loaded into memory, and they need to be decoded in an um, efficient way. And this takes some time. And if we need to load less data, we can reduce those times quite substantially. DGGS, it's not a new thing, and um, it's not a fuzzy thing. They have been formally defined in standards um, from ISO and um, OGC. So we have a definition about what the grid should look like, and there's some consensus um, about how to name those um, cells. However, there's still some flexible in the use of different versions of discrete global grid systems. There has been used in the past, more or less um, when it comes to integrate um, data sets of different spatial resolution, like um, flood map mapping. And um, DGGS systems, sometimes they sit kind of like in between uh, raster and vector data. So you can convert um, those um, together, integrating raster and vector data. Since um, you can not only use um, squares as a pixel, but also triangles or hexagons, um, they have been used by ESA in their soil moisture and um, ocean salinity um, mission in their uh, raw data uh, product, not because it's um, just um, a way to have equal area tiles, but because the sensors itself uh, reassemble an, an area of a hexagon on the ground surface. So when it comes to create such a discrete global grid system, we can choose um, between different versions. We can choose a different um, polyhedron like um, the platonic solid um, resembling um, the Earth, Usually we take an icosahedron because it's just um, the one with having the highest number of faces. So the more faces of um, the polyhedron we have, the more local projections we can apply, the less the distortions are in usual. We can choose different polygons, which are basically the cells or um, the pixels, so to speak. We can use between triangles, rectangles, or hexagons. Then there's a different aperture we can choose. Aperture is um, the amount of um, cells um, which belong to the same parent. So it's not a global grid, it's a global grid system, a system of grid at different spatial resolutions. If you um, look at traditional cock images, for instance, they usually have pyramids uh, with an aperture of four. And when it comes um, to work um, with data at global scale, you have um, a lot of data and you need to arrange those cells in, in an index in a space efficient uh, manner. And there's also different ways on how to sort those. There have been um, quite some tools when it um, comes to build the grid itself. Most of them, um, the most prominent one might be um, H3, which is a software developed um, by Uber um, when it um, comes to predicting um, taxi demand. Um, then there's also um, another uh, project um, called uh, Google S2, which is um, used under the hood in Google Maps, for instance. So in the past, we have all these definitions of the grid. 
we have tools to transform between geographical coordinates into the cell IDs and vice versa. But up to now, there is quite a substantial lack in actual software to deal with this data. So we do not have um, tools, especially open source tools, able to visualize um, DGGS um, data in a fast and efficient way. And um, we also do not have so many tools to do spatial operations on moving windows, like doing convolutions, for instance. So the thing I want to introduce is so-called DGGS native data cubes, where instead of a traditional data cube with longitude and latitude as its spatial coordinates, we just have um, the cell ID. And um, I want to store those data cubes because I want to save the data and I want to not only um, regrid it for every single step. So for me, um, the DGGS cell ID, it's not yet another name of a place, of an earth. I mean, there's thousands of names um, for a place, um, but we actually want to use this data structure and we want to use it for our machine learning algorithms so they can profit from the lowest distortions. When it comes to select an appropriate discrete global grid system, usually we want to have something which uses a Snyder equal area projection because those are the ones um, yielding into the least distortions. And when it comes to shape or angle distortions, we usually want to choose a DGGS system which is based on hexagons. Hexagons are not only the ones um, yielding a low um, angular um, distortion, but they're also very good when it comes to building bounding boxes or describing neighborhoods. For instance, if you look in a triangular grid, we have different distances to different types of neighbors. Even in a rectangular grid, um, some neighbors might be much more farther away than others. In a hexagonal grid, however, every neighbor has the same distance. And this makes us much easier um, when it comes to um, defining bounding boxes or if you just want to know what's around a given point. Another advantage of um, using hexagons is um, the use of so-called group convolution. Group convolution, not in terms of pooling, but in terms of um, mathematical group theory. The idea is um, that we want to have a pattern recognition, maybe, that is independent of their rotation. If you look at, uh, if you um, just make um, normal images on ground, there is gravity, so usually you do not really see images like this, or like that. So you do not care about the rotational independence. However, if you want to do some um, pattern learning and you're doing um, it on satellite imagery, sometimes you see patterns like this, or like that, or like that, and all of them should be classified in a machine learning model. And in a traditional convolutional neural network, you would need to basically present all kinds of those uh, rotations. Making a hexagon, um, you basically um, are faster in training those models in case you really want to have this rotational independence. Hexagons have been um, quite often used in um, structure and nature, ranging from honeycombs um, to the eyes of insects, maybe probably because of their compactness. So, when it comes to store the data, it's quite easy if we just do it on rectangular grids, right? We are storing longitude and latitudes in rows and columns, respectively. But how about hexagonal DGS grids? Well, there's basically two different ways in order to sort or arrange um, the cells. And the sorting is very important because this determines um, the time it takes um, to get some neighborhood um, boundaries and it also determines the way on how you chunk your data. And this is also very 
um, important when it works to data sets at global scale. So there's this one-dimensional index. Usually um, the name of each cell is just um, the prefix of the parent cell surrounding it, and then you just add another number depending on the different position. There's other um, one-dimensional indices like um, those based on space filling curves, um, but the, really the idea is to just have one number for each cell. The other approach is to use a multi-dimensional index. So it's a data cube. We, we are really not really forced to just use two dimensions. We can also use multiple or less, depending on what fits the data structure best. And um, the idea is to just have more options, more dimensions, in order to store the hexagons um, in those matrices. It turns out that when it um, comes um, to bounding box um, queries or adding cells and neighbor search, um, the one-dimensional index uh, usually performs quite bad. You, it takes much more time to figure out what the next um, cell would be looked like, um, rather than if you're just in a normal grid where you just need to add one um, to uh, coordinate. So we want to have a storage, which is a data cube, which is um, something rectangular, an n-dimensional array based of um, tensors um, without much gaps. And now we need to find a way on how to press all of the hexagons into this rectangular shape. And um, this is why we used um, DGGrid um, index, which basically um, takes this icosahedron having 20 faces, merging two of the faces together into one, and then we basically have 10 different matrices. And this is how to store hexagons in a rectangular grid. So the data cube itself, it doesn't know anything about the hexagons. It just has the three axes called N, I, and J. And we are just um, assuming that those are hexagons and we are just using it for visualization. So the idea is that if this is how it looks like in data space, this is basically how it really looks like on the surface. So if we want to do a convolution, um, the kernel uh, looks like um, this, but we need to um, just use this um, in order to um, have a one-to-one -one mapping so we can just work on those array space and this is basically equivalent as having it here. If you look um, here, uh, we cannot just use our X and Y coordinates for rows and columns because every second row is interleaved. However, if we just use um, this array um, format, um, we can still work with rectangular data structures while basically having an equivalent representations of hexagons. So we opted um, for an icosahedron because it has the highest number of phases. We opted for hexagons due to the um, nice properties. We used a Snyder equal area with an aperture of four and this um, three-dimensional Q2DI index. And um, this is um, what we uh, uh, did in the um, past uh, year. Um, so we took this um, grid um, software um, called DGGrid. It's written in um, C++ and we developed um, a Julia package around it, actually enabling us um, to not only transform between all of those coordinates, um, but also use it um, for spatial aggregation or bounding box queries. So this is a DGGS native data cube. You have all of your variables um, as usual, but instead of having longitude and latitude, you just have this specific discrete global grid system index. Up to now, we are able to um, transform um, raster data into um, DGGS native data cubes. We are able to do some visualizations and um, we are able to write um, the disk uh, arrays um, to ZAR format. When it comes to accessing um, the data, we have a grid system with different spatial resolution, which is 
kind of the equivalent um, of a pyramid. We can select a different spatial um, resolution yielding um, a layer. Then we can select a variable, let's say um, the temperature, and um, then we can do some um, spatial subsetting, like I want to have one point, and then I can just provide longitude and latitude, and then I will get one hexagon. However, we just want to have bounding box queries, which are um, disks in equivalent in DGGS. So basically, um, we just want to have the center and the neighbors, and maybe the neighbors of the neighbors again and again. And then we can just say, I want to have the center and one the first degree neighbors. And this is basically how to access the data. So we wrote a um, documentation. The, pub, uh, the package um, is public um, on GitHub. And you can download it and try it um, in your environment in case you are a Julia developer. When it comes to visualization, which is, I think, one of the most um, features in demand, um, we've implemented um, a so-called globe plot where you can um, just um, pin and pan and zoom into different areas of the globe. Then there's a map plot um, using traditional approaches of projections. And then we did this so-called uh, native block, which looks a little bit weird, but this is actually um, how the data is uh, being stored. So here we have this icosahedron, and all of those um, points um, are displayed directly without the need to regridding it into latitude and longitude um, space anymore. We used um, SAR as a data format, um, allowing us to have a very flexible um, chunking, so we can store our array in memory, in file systems, we can serve it um, through S3. And the thing is that despite you, most of us uh, might be not a Julia um, developer, we were able to um, access um, the um, data cubes in all languages because it's just based on SARS. So in case you're using R or Python, there's also a way to access the data. Besides um, our package, um, there's um, another um, package um, being developed um, currently right now, which is called XDGGS. It's um, based um, on Python, and it's an extension of XArray. This package um, uses um, a one-dimensional index, and um, our package uses um, a multi-dimensional index. Sometimes it um, depends on how equal area your um, cells might be, so how important accuracy, spatial accuracy and spatial distortions is for your use case. And it also depends on the um, size of your data set. If you are doing with uh, vector data, if you just have a bunch of uh, points, it doesn't really matter which uh, package um, to use. So to sum things up, discrete global grid systems with a multidimensional index and hexagonal cells are the ones yielding um, the least um, distortions. They have an accurate representation of um, directions and neighborhoods. We found an efficient um, data cube um, storage format with almost no overlaps. And we were able to do this um, bounding box uh, retrievals um, or disk in a more or less um, tame time and um, space efficient manner. Thank you. <laughs>